And I want to connect this to your China mentioning and billions of people who live differently, let's say, than we do in, in Europe. In the uh, last couple of weeks, you were very actively read here in, 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 in England, your correspondence with Nadezhda Tolokonikova mm. from Pussy Riot. You know the joke about Berlusconi, I like it. I was told in Moscow that immediately after Pussy Riot scandal, uh, Berlusconi called Putin, oh, I want to visit Moscow. <laughs> They asked him why, because, he, because I saw on TV screen these this posters, free pussies, free pussies, you know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> go on, <laughs> just a multicultural reaction, sorry, <laughs> No, but we, now uh, Putin led Russia is, is on the rise on all fronts, and we have seen several successes of uh, of Russia's uh, in international diplomacy. Yeah, yeah. Moral, yeah, yeah. So, and Putin is doing increasingly well. Uh, yeah, so you seem, with your support of Nadezhda, mm -hmm. you seem to be waging a lost war. And my question is, the Russian autocratic model, yeah. the Chinese autocratic yeah. model, or the Gulf states, yeah. uh, which are the worst, they are new slave society, yeah, the Gulf states. states yeah. No, but we are constantly being threatened by power holders here, and those promoting neoliberalism, yeah, more yeah. austerity measures. If you don't like, the alternative yeah. is Russia, China, or, um, yeah. or Gulf states. How can we on the left turn this against them so that it's not used as a threat but because they are so uh, authoritarian and slave society we want Europe to be even better and not to accept the neoliberal austerity measures because there is worse but how can we uh, well my answer is very simple uh, uh, okay but so simple. yeah 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 but I know that would agree, yes. My answer is simply that, yes, that's my pessimism in the terms of capitalism. Authoritarian, ca neoliberal capitalism is the future. Yeah, but I, I could tell them, if we go on doing what you are telling us to do, we will end up as Russia, China, yeah, or Gaza. Yeah, yeah. So because of that, we have to change. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, think, I think there is a choice here. If, if only, like... The, my, the way I react to sincere liberals who, is, who are worried about freedoms and so on, I tell them, you know, only a more radical left can save you. If you just go on the way you do with new liberal measures and so on, we will slowly approach the same, the same, the same authoritarian regime. Here I agree with a guy who is usually dismissed as a right-winger, but I appreciate him, Peter Sloterdijk who said this 10 years ago. He said that Singapore is the future. This is where capitalism is moving. And I think this, if anything, gives us a, gives us a unique chance. Because we can sincerely say that, as I always repeat, this eternal marriage between capitalism and democracy is not as eternal as it may seem to be. Now it's clearly approaching a divorce. And that's what I found wonderful irony. My answer to Fukuyama is, listen, maybe you were right, you were right, liberal capitalism won, but ex-communists ex -communist turn out to be the best managers of this. Which is my, no, just the final point. This is my point. We are racist in a bad Eurocentrist way when we dismiss this Capitalism with Asian values, countries, as you know, yeah, because they are not so civilized, they are more primitive, they need some primitive uh, authoritarian ideological structure to function. But when I was recently on our communist fourth meeting in Korea, Saul Giri, my Indian friend, told me, no, that an, uh, uh, an investigation in India has shown that precisely this young managers whom you would have thought they are the tool of freedom, you know, young, successful, postmodern, digital guys and so on, that in their private lives they tend to be much more fundamentalist, religious, Hindu than otherwise. The problem is that the reference to uh, the ethnic 
ethnic values and so on is already totally transfunctionalized by global, by global capitalism. It's totally wrong to see that if we are Western permissive liberal, that we are somehow more, more fit to practice digital capitalism. No. We, we are, if we remain at the level of capitalist dynamics, we are lost. We have to, and here I would say, this is my reason, maybe you again don't totally agree, that I think maybe it's worth fighting for European legacy. I was shocked when I, uh, when I was uh, in India to discover something, and Sarah Giri gave me some documents. How, for example, concerning English language, do you know that the more you go up the social ladder, the Brahmin, they talk all the time about Hindu traditions, Indian, English colonialism is threatening us. The more you go down, the more they are pro-English. The Dalits, the, the untouchables, all like English. Why? Because as a foreign language, it allows them an escape from all that Indian bullshit, hierarchic traditions, and so on and so on. And I think that this is the fundamental legacy of even capitalist modernity that we should accept. We have to lose our roots. We have to be wounded. Only in this way we can liberate ourselves. What do I mean with this? Just my formula and then I go on. The example that I use often. Uh, that's why I admire Malcolm X. What did he do? You know, Malcolm X. X stands for we don't have a family name. We were torn out of our African roots and so on. Okay, now how do you react to this? You have two ways. One is like the cheaty TV series Roots, so let's go back and find our roots or whatever. Malcolm X's answer was exactly the opposite one. His reaction was not, let's search, let's try to recapture our African roots. No, his answer was, but this very mega trauma, we being cut off from our roots, gives us a unique chance to be more modern than Europeans themselves, to build in this void a much more emancipatory universality and so on. And this is, I think, why I have a deep mistrust of this idea Local cultures, traditions, and so on, are a defense against global capitalism. No, they are its perfect tool. The only way to break out of capitalism is to accept, fully endorse this deracination, losing roots, universality. This would be my modern definition of Marxist proletarian position, and so on, and so on. No, here I would agree, uh, but... Uh, but, uh, but. <laughs> and I will go on. Uh, first, uh, uh, of all, you mentioned, uh, the, both of you, Buan and you, you mentioned Fukuyama several times. Uh, I, would, I, I would like to start with this and then answer your question, actually, to, oh. be, to try to be not only pessimistic and pacifistic, as you said, uh, but also uh, constructive. Uh, I had the opportunity, as uh, I think Slavo knows, uh, to, to, to meet uh, Francis Fukuyama in Paris, I think it was 2011. Uh, we had a two-hour conversation or something like that. And you know, at one point of time, uh, we of course spoke about uh, the end of history. Yeah. And I asked him, do you really believe uh, yeah. the end of history came? And you know what he said? Yeah. Uh, I don't believe in it, in it anymore because of two reasons. Well, one uh, is biogenetics? No, 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 no. Here he mentioned only two yeah. other reasons. The first is right-wing extremism. He said this only one, uh, one month before Anders Breivik. Uh, massacre. Yeah. Uh, and here I agree actually with you that he still has this uh, fantasy that right-wing extremism is not part of the system, yeah, the yeah, problem yeah. of the system, but that it's something yeah. outside which yeah. can, you know, ruin yeah. capitalism yeah. as such. And the second what he said that was very interesting, uh, I asked him something about Al-Qaeda, do you think Al-Qaeda is still dangerous? And he said, uh, no, I think China is even more dangerous than Al-Qaeda. Uh, what happened then is that I published this conversation uh, in, a, in a famous creation, not so famous, but whatever, uh, <laughs> actually now neoliberal weekly. Uh, after the interview, uh, the Chinese ambassador in Croatia gave an even bigger interview for, for, for this weekly uh, with the title, uh, Francis Fukuyama is a banana man. Uh, which means uh, we in China call all those people who are from outside yellow, from inside white, we call them banana people. And of course here I would be on Fukuyama's side because it's a completely racist uh, argument uh, without any 
coherence, and I would even go further, and I would say actually that we should inverse this banana thesis, or how to call it, I don't know, that what we have today is that Europe is from outside, I don't know what's the fruit or vegetable for it, maybe you can remember, from outside it's white, from inside it's yellow. I don't know if you have such a vegetable or not. What I claim to say, it's actually the same what you said in several of your texts, is that the marriage between democracy and capitalism yeah, yeah, is yeah, over. Yeah. What we have in Europe is actually capitalism without democracy as well. Yeah. And here I to return to, to your question to be more constructive. What I think uh, was created in the last two years, and of course Mike Davis in oh. his article in, in yeah. your review said at one point spring is the shortest season. Uh, but then he deconstructed, not mm. in the, uh, the post-colonial way, but he, in a way, criticized this thesis as well. I wouldn't say spring is the shortest season in that way. I think a lot of, and I, I, I really want to hear from you, uh, if you would agree, actually, that a lot of things were created, maybe not in Slovenia, maybe not in Croatia, but what happened, for example, in Italy, is Teatro Valle Occupato. It's a theater which, which is occupied by, by people who work in theater, by actors, by directors, yeah. choreographers, and so yeah. on. In Greece, you had uh, the potato movement, which may sound uh, ridiculous, but for example, in Croatia, you could need a potato movement to get rid of this total rich guy. You know, it's, it's a very simple idea. You don't sell the fruits to, to a distributor, to a shopping mall, but you sell it as in communist times. Remember, you know, when Roma people were coming to our apartments and screaming, yeah. Krumpira, Krumpira, you know, you sell uh, the vegetables directly to the people. Uh, you have, for example, okay, this is not a result of, of, the, of the movements, you have Mondragon, uh, which is the fourth most powerful corporation in Spain, which functions not as self-management as we knew it, but as a sort of cooperative. And last but not least, of course, we have Syriza in Greece. So what we have actually in Greece, and of course, Currently, there are some, some people even criticize you that you are a social democrat, which I wouldn't agree, of course. Uh, they say Syriza is now a social democrat, uh, democratic party because they want to grab the power. But what you have in Greece is actually that really a powerful force was created after the occupations, unlike the Occupy Wall Street movement in York, unlike the, the yeah, occupations yeah, yeah. in Slovenia, unlike the <coughs> occupations in Croatia. So to conclude, to answer your question is that what we have to do, what is to be done, is not only have the, the, the movements and not only have political parties. And I'm not fetishizing as many leftists do Latin America, but, but, but the, uh, the, 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 the participatory budget in Porto Alegre was created not because only of a movement, but because they had also a political party. Of course, Lula and so on afterwards. But why don't you uh, would you be ready to go a step further and say in not way, only movements, not only political parties, but state power where possible? Of yeah. course. Exactly. No, that, that's what I'm saying. With all that comes... No, can I... No, 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 not with Gulag and all the stuff. Not Gulag, but I know the secret police. Let me... There is something you have already spoken And this is the last uh, comment uh, yeah. I give you three minutes to make, because we want... But you know I cite the metaphysical linear notion of time. <laughs> So, three minutes. No, but he's like, you know, when some other friend with whom... Uh, it's no, very short, it's very one short. One of the, the, the arguments and the articles in this book is that it's called Margaret Thatcher of the left, when you advocate this idea that we need Margaret Thatcher at the left, or you ask for a new master. So, I find it very provocative, and can you share uh, with us before we open the floor to the audience? Okay, nonetheless, if I can answer quickly, I agree with your fruit metaphor, no? What's the fruit? Uh, no, my f fruit is watermelon, of course. What? Green and... Green and red inside, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We pretend to be green, mother nature, blah, 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 ha, ha, ha. We are red inside. <laughs> 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 then you have Fischer and Cohn Bandit. Sorry? Then you have Joshka Fischer and Cohn Bandit, or no? No, they are traitors both. <laughs> they are they are unripe melon, green, a little bit red, and then white in the middle still, so don't mention them. But nonetheless, I want to make clear one point. You know, with all, and we are right, criticizing radically Europe and so on. What I nonetheless insist, and we simply shouldn't forget it, is that even the tools with which the way we criticize Europe is come out of European 
legacy. For example, my friend Bilan Somai from Turkey, who will defend this Friday his doctor thesis, gives in his book a wonderful, in his thesis, uh, The Orient Doesn't Exist, a wonderful example how in Turkey you had in the last decades against the Kemalist enforced modernization a movement of middle class Muslim women who, provoking the official ban on being veiled, insist of having their right to wear veils. And he is right to point out that this is absolutely not simply a return to tradition. Of course, it is a street content, it may appear, but the way they do it, it's a typical postmodern, even uh, identity politics stuff, you know, we want to be recognized, to show ourselves the way we want, and so on and so on. And so, uh, again, we should always be attentive to this, the, that Europe is always giving us, at the same time, the tools to criticize Europe itself. This is, I mean, but by Europe, I mean what? I mean precisely this universalist legacy and so on. And from here, I draw a radical conclusion. My conclusion is that the defenders of Europe today, the European right-wing anti-immigrants, I think we should not simply attack them from some vague universal, oh, you are too European, you don't see we are part of a global world. No! Why to... To, uh, to leave to them, why to allow them to m monopolize the, the word Europe? I would say, that, no, they are the true threat to Europe. Can you imagine Europe where people like, uh, name them, like Le Pen and Haider and Berlusconi rule? This would no longer be Europe. If by Europe we mean what was great in Europe. So we should nonetheless fight for Europe. They are the true threat to Europe. Don't, the, my point here is don't, don't, it's the same paradox that I like to repeat apropos, for example, family values. The usual left liberal replies, uh, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, you ask okay, but you are noted by the authorities and... <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but the secret police, yeah. no, sorry, what I want to say is it's the same with family values. I hate when leftists just reply family values or reactionary Christian notion, we need open marriages, whatever. No, my answer to conservatives is, but who are you to dare to talk about family values? The neoliberal politics did more to destroy authentic family life than my God, than, than all the gay rights activists together or whatever. You know, that's uh, my point. So, but nonetheless, to go on with that, you master. No, I was even shocked that my text uh, provoked such a violent reaction because my first argument would be purely empirical. Show me one radical emancipatory movement which didn't, for, which didn't didn't generate a leader figure. Like people told me, in Venezuela it's wonderful. In cooperatives, people taking over, blah, blah, blah. Yes, because you have Chavez up on the top there and so on. And what I claim is that, what I try to do, maybe it's risky, I will try to do it now, is to formulate the notion of what, very naively, I don't go into high theory now, what I would have called an authentic master as opposed to authoritarian bad master. Bad master is the one who gives orders, who deprives you of your freedom, no? The bad master is who tells you, work like ora et labora, work and pray, pray, celebrate me. Or Erdogan in Turkey, wonderful, I read in Bilat Somay's thesis. You know what was its wonderful? The electoral mock slogan of Erdogan's, this Islamist party. Uh, shop and pray. <laughs> it's wonderful, like consumerism plus a little bit of Muslim identity and so on. No, so authentic master, sorry, the f fake master is like Stalinist. They know better than you what is good for you and they are ready to enforce it on you. But for me, an authentic master is the one who just gives you a kick to return yourself to, like, even with all the horrors of cultural revolution, I always found touching, you know, that famous message from the beginning of cultural revolution when Mao wrote to students, you have the right to rebel. That's for me the message of a true master. You have, the true master simply tells you, you can. 
You can do it. You can do the impossible. And I claim for reasons that I will not go into theory now that somebody has to kick you from outside. I don't believe in autonomous subjectivity in the sense of, you know, you become aware of your freedom. No, because when people claim I call for a new authority master, I tell them, your mistake is that you think that in our society, which is allegedly without masters, that you are free. But you are not free. Our paradox today is precisely our consumerist individualism, however we call it, it's a kind of a conformist, resigned, cynical blindness. And for me, again, the message of a master is just this one, and this is what an authentic master does. Just the message is, you can do it, do it. It just calls you up to your freedom. What happens after, I don't know. Many masters then go crazy and begin to believe that they are really masters, so we liquidate them. I find no problem in that. I mean, but you know what I mean? My pessimism is in this, that I don't believe in this liberal notion of autonomous freedom, you become aware of your freedom. No, liberal individualist freedom, I will be very radical here, is precisely the very form we experience our non-freedom today. And that's why, if I may make another jump, that's why I find like uh, Edward Snowden's revelation so important. It's not simply anti-Americanism. I'm well aware that, for example, uh, that China is much worse at the level of how free you feel than United States. I mean, but China has cynically one privilege. No one there even thinks that they are free. Everyone knows. You have Politburo standing, you know who is the boss. The, the, the importance of Snowden is that he showed us how there is, can be an extraordinary level of control regulation in a country where you are simply not aware of it, where you simply think that you are that you are free, you don't see it, and we can be uh, controlled. That's, that's, that, that's the importance of it. So no, I'm not calling for new Stalin or whatever. I just don't think that late, my God, this horrible term I use, late capitalist, bourgeois, individualism, narcissistic subjectivity, I don't think that this form of freedom is enough. I think that, that you have to be, as it were, kicked out of it. You need an external... And on that note, external, the audience, students have the right to ask. But now I talk as a Stalinist, but we speak for them. We know that we already said, why listen to them? It will just introduce, confu introduce confusion, you know. We already explained to them what is good for them. Okay, sorry. Focusing on the political correctness and tolerance rather than uh, the economic situation, because like I think most people don't really care and they're mostly neutral if like as regards the gay marriages and so on. But th what they care is that they they're un unemployed. So given that the left is focusing on the <laughs> gay rights and minorities' rights, they don't really like you know you, you know what I mean. Like yes. the left is just going into the wrong direction, their the, the emphasis is Thank way you. wrong. Uh, more questions up there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Did you speak with Bulgarians about Macedonia? Yes. <laughs> there, how, how do they relate to that? That's for me always the traumatic point. Do they admit the autonomy or do they treat Macedonians are their own, as their own subspecies? <laughs> So they are not just victims, no, they also have their own small... <laughs> Here I totally agree, it's like, it should be bombed, I mean, there I would support NATO bombing. Let's have another question, so let's, uh, here in the middle. Can you say that you don't have water? No, you don't have water. Please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Costas Duzinas yesterday during a book presentation here in London referred to the three main factors that uh, um, must to be met in order to in order to see an overthrow to, to you know to become real in a political overthrow. The first factor is a strong uh, political desire. The second factor is uh, a very concrete, radical uh, political object. And the third factor, during, uh, according to... Sorry, what do you mean by object? Program or what? A program, political okay. platform, and of course a party. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in the end. And um, the third factor is a catalyst that is going to, you know, is going to work in order to, to, to help the other two factors uh, to, to see this overthrow to become real. So, uh, according to your point of view, Sretsko and uh, Slavoj as well, what is this catalyst for you uh, in order to see an overthrow in a national but most, important, uh, most importantly in a European level? Behind you, there was another question. Fuck you, you said three questions. <laughs> now it's the fourth. Yeah. Yes. Just. <laughs> because the microphone was here. Yeah, 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 this opportunist, ex so <laughs> social democratic excuses, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this could be for the whole panel. Um, you said uh, economy, we have to look at the economy, and I would say this is the only way you can make sense of any of these questions. Uh, uh, you said austerity doesn't make any sense, uh, which, which is true, um, because it ends up undermining the stability it's meant to prop up, but it's also clearly necessary for states to maintain their credit rating so that it can maintain quantitative easing and so the crisis doesn't happen again. I mean, all, all of these political questions can sort of be pushed aside, I think, a bit when you have the, the fact that um, over the past 40 years, state debt to GDP ratios have risen pretty consistently, um, even during boom times, and uh, like in tw from 20 2007 to 2011, U.S. public debt rose from 62% to 100% of GDP. So what do you have to say about that? I mean, austerity is necessary, but what, what's the future? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you begin. No, no, no. That, that, that was, you know, you say when, when you have to pay lunch, then you say you begin, and then I say, no, 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 please, Slava, you. <laughs> no, no, but, but I, I will pay the lunch. Anyway, uh, the first question, very short answer, yes. Because that, that was the thing we were speaking all the time about, you know, yeah. how political correctness and all these cultural identities and everything is actually, you know, if you don't think about political economy, then, then you don't have... You know, you, you don't have the, the right critique anymore. But on the other hand, as I said, I think today we are in such dark times that we have to take care also of, of other problems. Uh, the second question uh, regarding Bulgaria and cultural heritage. Uh, here I must be a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> skeptical and cynical as well. You know, yes, Serbia has a great cultural heritage, but you know what's the product? The product is the rehabilitation of, of the Chetnici and so on. And I don't know if Boyan would agree, you know, of the collaborators of fascism. 
Uh, yes, Croatia has a great cultural heritage, but you know it was uh, the country, uh, one of the uh, ex-republics of Yugoslavia, which had the, the biggest rate of destroyed anti-fascist monuments. So you have no anti-fascist cult cultural heritage anymore. You can uh, add, yeah. Let me add, because I was yeah, yeah, uh, in, in Dubrovnik this summer, and I was glad to read this uh, review recently again, which suggested people not to go to Dubrovnik. It's a beautiful place, but it is destroyed by overdevelopment and uh, particularly these uh, uh, neoliberalist, monopolist, consume, total rich uh, type of guys. You have four kinds of shops. You think you are in a labyrinth. You go, there are three shops, and then suddenly the same shop <laughs> comes again and, uh, in Dubrovnik. It's all in hands of four people. You cannot get anything handmade or produced locally in the whole city of Dubrovnik. It's a torture of neoliberal capitalism. So, you know, this heritage is a uh, two-sided uh, sword, uh, so to say. No, in a way, it's a tool to get more money. On the other hand, it's a tool for, for a legitimate, a le yeah. legitimization of, of different sorts of uh, whatever. But, but, but the, 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 I will come back to the catalyst. Actually, I will ask you a question, because obviously me and Slavo weren't there at, at our friends' uh, debate. Uh, what was the, 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 the answer of Kostas? Who is the catalyst? I didn't ask him. Huh? You didn't ask him. Why? No, no, he didn't answer. So we will ask him. Social forces. But as I said, I think without social forces, without a political party and a party without social forces, that was the biggest mistake of the, of the left movement, I think, in the past 20 years. Uh, the, the answer behind it, then I will pass the floor to, to, to Slavo. I think cred the ideology of credit rating is pure bullshit, you know. Uh, you, you need to get a better credit rating in, in order to get an even bigger debt. <laughs> and our friend Maurizio Lazarato has written a lot about yeah. it. And you know, what the, the, the biggest banks in the US be, before the financial meltdown had the best credit rating just a few days before the financial meltdown. So I think the credit rating, and if you, if you read books about the history of credit rating agencies, you will see they rule the world, actually, with, with the credit rating. Yeah. And that it's pure ideology which doesn't make, it doesn't have any any, any connection with the GDP and so on. I mean, it's like statistics when they speak about the GDP doesn't make any connection with the real lives of people in, in, in some country. Slavo. Okay, very briefly, I will try it. Yes, uh, I agree this point about uh, 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 credit rate. I, I would even say that what I like in Laz uh, it's Lazarato. Lazarato, yeah, his book on the rise of the indebted man, is that he shows very well, and we should always be aware of it. This is a wonderful example of credit, all the credit problem of the psychoanalytic notion of superego, where, you know, it's uh, like when they put pressure on you all the time, repay your debt, repay your debt. They don't really want you to repay your debt. The, the whole point is to keep you in an internal, under an internal pressure. It's an, it's a, an, an ideal tool of permanent control, slavery, and so on and so on. You know, uh, this, uh, uh, controlling how are you uh, meeting your debt and so on and so on. And what Lazarato also does. I will develop this in my new book, referring to him, is how uh, it's even at the personal level. Have it here already. Maybe. A text uh, Lazarato, yeah. uh, may, oh, really? Oh, yeah. my God. Uh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. No, what I like is this idea of how, even at a personal level, today, precisely the fact that all of us are more or less indebted enables a wonderful ideological operation. That all of us, you know, in old capitalism, Marxists, some of us were bourgeois, some of us were workers or whatever, but we were all formally equal as free citizens and so on. Now, in the latest stage of ideology, we are all capitalists. You know, in one way, uh, the key term here of this ideology is self-entrepreneurship. The idea is that, let's say you are a father of a family, and you borrow money and then you can decide will you invest it into your health into your son's or daughter's education or whatever the idea is that you are here dealing as a small capitalist that through allocating your debts 
you are basically at a smaller level the same as a big capitalist, you know. So, you see, I'm simplifying it now, but you know, the idea is then, what's the problem? There are no workers, we are all capitalists, we are just investing differently, and so on, and so on. It's a, it's a wonderful... Can I just add two things to this? Yeah. You know, you were like the first thing, when I was one month ago in India, you know, they, they still have this good old colonialist habit that they put the newspapers uh, under your door in the hotel room. But here I am for colonialism. Yeah, yeah, what here I am about about as well because you can see what the enemy is doing. So I got the newspaper at 7 in the morning and yeah. it was the daily edition of Times of India. And on the cover page there was only one, one motto. Every Indian can be an entrepreneur. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly yeah, yeah, the thing yeah, what you are saying. Yeah. And the other point, I don't know if you, you've seen what, what the king of, 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 of Holland was, was saying, I think it was two, day, uh, two, 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 two months ago. So he gave an, a, a, an official address of the government on the national television to the Dutch people, and he said the welfare state is dead. And what we have instead of the welfare state is the participation society. What it means is that we, 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 we cannot rely on the state anymore. Everyone has to be, as you said, yeah, a yeah, small yeah. capitalist. If you want uh, health care, you have to buy it. If you want social security, you have to buy it and so on. So I think these two examples and actually again, uh, yes. confirm what you just said. And again, the wonderful thing is that this way of being deprived of your freedom is then presented to you as a new freedom. Like, you know, it's not just decided by state your welfare, but you are free to choose. Do you want more welfare security? Do you want more amusement or whatever? Yes, speaking about what you said, the, the first question, just briefly, political correctness, tolerance left, I agree with you. I would just like to add your thing that, uh, one thing that, you know, as I often repeat, the very term tolerance is suspicious here for me. Because I don't think it's a term we should use. Let's not, you know, I find it very suspicious how today every anti-sexist, anti-racist struggle is automatically translated into the terms of tolerance. I don't find this uh, necessary. Let's take a big example, we all agree he was a great guy, Martin Luther King. I always repeat it, go to the web, to the net and download his speeches and put that, search, find, whatever. And you will see he never uses the term tolerance. It would have been humiliating for me to say what? We blacks want more tolerance from white people or whatever. It's ridiculous. Toler racism is translated into tolerance at a very precise moment when economy is depoliticized, you are not allowed to talk about class issues, so all of a sudden, instead of talking about legal, economic conditions of racism, it, become a, it becomes kind of pseudo-psychoanalytic topic, you know. Why don't I tolerate you? What trauma of myself did I project onto you? So let's do collective psychoanalysis or what? Here I'm definitely anti-Freudian, if this is it, no? Just this point. Bulgaria. Yes, I agree with your line, you know. I wouldn't put Bulgaria in such a uh, desperate position. What I'm always trying to think along the lines of line of political thinkers that I like from ancient Chinese legalists to, uh, to Malcolm X is to see things which may appear as weakness as an advantage. The way you describe Bulgaria, it can be a bad thing, but maybe it, it gives them much more freedom to re reinvent themselves. Because I think that, again, uh, the way we can boast also with Slovenes, Middle European traditions, all that, but I think this doesn't help us a lot, maybe it's even uh, uh, an obstacle, but I cannot resist, that's my evil nature, to tell you, maybe you know it, a wonderful story about Bulgaria. I read two, three years ago, it's not about Bulgaria, it's about Western European racism, really. I, you know, when Slovenia became member of European Union and some other new states, some British newspaper did the opinion poll about West, uh, uh, among British population, which are the features that they identify a new member of European Union with. You know what were the two features most popular in identifying uh, Bulgaria, and I like it. The first one is, you no, know, don't they have, that's the myth, I'm talking about racism now. Don't you have in Bulgaria those people who are 100 years old, but if, because they drink the right yogurt, they still can fuck and so on and all that. So that's the one thing about Bulgaria. The other is, you remember in the 70s, or where, that well-known incident where a Bulgarian a umbrella, you know, 
Everyone remembers Bulgaria. So I would say to Bulgarian friends, why don't you start to produce those poisoning umbrellas and so on? <laughs> Sorry? And the yogurt, yogurt revolution, yes, and umbrellas. No, but I'm quite serious. Maybe, you know, all these countries, I mean, really, uh, big tradition can be can be a burden and what appears as a victim what can appear as a weakness can also always be uh, can also always be a, a resort the only thing i have a problem is when you mention this anti-turkish resentment no it got me into a lot of trouble with turkish leftists when i emphasized you know my youth our youth Okay, I'm older than you, I remember it. How we were taught again and again, Turks, occupiers, terrorizing us, Slavic nations, and so on. But if you look closely, it was much different. You know, like, according to all normal standards, Turks were relatively, 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 uh, relatively easy, soft occupiers. Like, they never crushed the Christians. You just, I think you had to pay a little bit more, as in Muslim states, a little bit more of a, of a, of a tax or whatever, but it was relatively open. I mean, one thing, I always quote it, can give you the message I want to deliver. Only in comparison to West yeah. European empires. Yeah. It was oppression, it was, uh, but they would never extinct the Christians like they did with Jews and Muslims in Spain or France or Germany. That's what I want to say, yes. The, and you know what's so interesting? That when did the Turks commit their big crimes? That is to say, uh, Armenia and then Kurds. That's it was learned. modernization, yes. When they wanted to become a Western modern nation state. So that's uh, an interesting point here. Uh, so uh, then... Uh, about uh, uh, about a catalyst. Uh, you know what I would have said here? Uh, I always believe, how do you start a process of change? You cannot predict it in advance. I don't think a catalyst can be an a priori category. For example, okay, it didn't develop into a big change, but it was some kind of protest movement in Turkey. Uh, uh, Taksim Square, Gezi Park, you know. You know what was the motto I was told there? The motto was dignity. And this dignity was directed specifically, you know, the big demand was not just end of uh, capitalist uh, corruption, end of this, end of whatever. No, the motto was Erdogan has to go. Why? Because his patronizing attitude. For example, uh, uh, Erdogan, when at some round tables he saw someone smoking, he approached him, took out of his mouth the cigarette, extinguished it, and patted him on his shoulder and said, don't do that, it's not good for you, and so on. I mean, this was his general approach, you know, telling people you had to have at least three... Uh, but here we have some real story. When, when your son wanted to smoke, what did you do? What? What did I do? I you don't remember what you told me. You gave him the cigarette, try how bad it is, and then he never smoked again. No, uh, it worked when my older son was six years old, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, even, I even taught him that he should go to the store and tell it's for my dad, and so on. But I did a good thing, because, again, it was so... Ah, uh, no, uh, 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 never till, till he was 14, when, under the pressure of uh, colleagues and so on, he started again to smoke. But I did succeed for... I did succeed for a, no, 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 <laughs> to tell you a dirty private story, my children, I educate them in my way, like three days ago it happened, I was mad at my younger son, and I told him, you know, in the third proverb, you know, your body pass matter, like, <laughs> let the dog fuck your mother, you know what was his answer? My, a dog already did that and I am the result. Like that I am a dog and so on. That's Marxist education. Okay, but let's go on. No, the catalyst problem. You know what I claim here that you cannot... So again, the catalyst was not simply what they wanted to do with that Gezi Park and so on. But it was, I think, authentic revolutions always start at this. The catalyst can be a certain law which is not popular, a certain person, and so on. And then a certain dynamic started. And if those in power and intelligent, but most of the time they are not, they immediately concede the point and prevent the explosion. You know, like, you have them, okay, okay, you are right, he should step down, and so on, and it's over. Because, and I think that 
Let me give you another example. People often ask me why am I such a revisionist that I even still have certain sympathy for Obama. Ah, I claim, again, I repeat myself, maybe some of you know the story. I think that his health care, universal health care program, I know the result is a total compromise, nothing. But obviously he stirred up an incredibly crucial debate, which rendered visible the limits of American notion of freedom. Which is why, are you aware what a trauma his program is for? Are you aware that American Republican right was ready to stop practically to ruin the entire state? And you see, this would be a good catalyst, because the true art of politics, I claim, is you don't start with the big ace, the big revolutionary program. You start with a small point. And then it triggers an avalanche, and so on and so on. And the art is to find the proper tiny point. Like, in, in Europe, we consider this usual, universal health care. In America is, and can I tell you another story which I like here? Very short one. Yeah. I'm from Greece. From? I know, I noticed it. My Nazi instinct, <laughs> racial identification work well. Yeah, because uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, look, I discovered a wonderful example to see what Americans don't see. You know the biggest American iconic pop song, Frank Sinatra's My Way, I'll Do It My Way. But do you know that this song is the American version of a French song, which is called Comme d'habitude, as usual. Isn't it irony that what in France is just as usual, stupid American think it's my way, individual, and so on. <laughs> What Americans don't see is to be really able to do it my way. Quite many things have to function comme d'habitude, you know. Like what they don't see is that really functioning democracy and then social organization are not mutually exclusive. They are totally wrong when they think, for example, in totalitarianism there was too much planning, not enough initiative. Are they crazy? Uh, I read some good books on Soviet economy under Brezhnev and discovered beneath the surface of total planning. It was totally chaotic, nothing functioned, you know, like you are in a co state company producing, uh, for example, uh, chairs, tables. You waited for, according to the plan, a certain company should send you, should send, should send you wood. Uh, cut it, wood, and so on. It doesn't work, so you have to improvise, and so on. O on the contrary, Soviet economy was extremely chaotic. So I think that what we should be aware of is that we need to be effectively free. Free in the sense you do what you want, you walk around, you feel safe. We need an extremely dense organization. And that's the problem with Americans. They still think that to be free is to walk in the Wild West with a gun or whatever, you know. So uh, again, you see, in the United States, raising a thing like that, which maybe for us is self-evident, can be... Can, can, can be a catalyst to maybe trigger some, I don't know where it would have happened, but it would have totally changed the American political identity. And in different countries, it's different. Like, for example, and that's my, when they accuse me here, social democratic revisionism of what? What I spoke with uh, Tsipras is that uh, not you should limit yourself to social democratic problem, but that because of the specific situation of Greece, the immense state clientelism in the set. In Greece, to really create a normal functioning state of law, sorry, a uh, uh, functioning state where laws are obeyed and so on, means a total revolution, a much more radical revolution than, than elsewhere and so on. Which is why Tsipras is a wise guy. He always opposed simple anti-European rhetorics. He has no illusions here. It's interesting to know this, that it is new democracy, which, the way I saw it, you remember maybe the last electoral summit in the last election of new democracy, and I remember there, new democracy, an old lady shouting, who are the Germans to tell us what to do? They were still playing football with uh, human heads, while we already had ice kilos and Sophocles and so on. You know, the, while uh, Tsipras is well aware that 
Greece also needs Europe, and Tsipras has no illusions about looking for help elsewhere. Now I will tell you, I hope I will not embarrass again Tsipras. But he told me that representatives from Russia came to him and told him, okay, if you split with Europe, we can help you, but they gave him a detailed list. Telecom, this, that, what they want to buy. Plus, of course, they wanted a nice island for 99 years, military base. As to the Chinese, uh, you must know that it's horror. The Chinese bought the port of Piraeus, and they are there more brutal than any Western company would have dared to do. So again, or in Turkey, a simple call for multicultural tolerance, like admitting Armenian genocide, Kurds, and so on. In Turkey, it means a revolution, and so on. So you see, that's crucial. Capitalism is uneven. And sometimes, you know, like, and this is why I support Nadezhda and the, the pussies. <laughs> because that's their message, and which is why they are less and less popular in the West. They are not the same as Kasparov and that liberal critics of, no? They are not saying we are primitive in Russia, we need to join Western liberal capitalism. No. Their problem is precisely that... Uh, that I'm sorry, this is not... Uh, no, 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 it's they, what they are fully, I'm very sorry, what they are fully aware is that Russian capitalism, the way it is, it fits world, world market. That to bring true democracy to Russia, it's not enough to play the West against Russia. That the West is in a way co-responsible for it. And this is why, this is what, so you see, my point would have been, Catalysts are different here and there, but we should always be aware that a true process of change never begins with a big goal, communist revolution or whatever. You start with something small and then you get it. If we really want this, we have to go a step further and a step further and so on. And this is a great uh, final uh, message. Uh, I want to uh, thank once again our guests, uh, Srećko Horvat and Slavoj Žižek, and to all of you. Uh, wait a minute, one second. If I can, I don't have time, but I would love to, to reply to this leaflet, just two things. In second paragraph, they include to me some kind of a peace project. My God, me and peace project, not. And another one, at the end, they said, I undoubtedly have noble intentions. No, I don't have noble intentions. <laughs> Uh, this was live streamed, uh, this event was live streamed and you can see it again. Uh, if